We go to bed, we wake up one day, and then we wake up to a a price of Bitcoin being set at a million dollars US. It jumps 10x overnight, and people are wondering, well, what just happened? Wall Street's got no idea what it's got itself in for. They think they're going to control this beast. They don't understand that this is just the start of something that's going to completely redefine what Wall Street is, how much is a home going to cost. I wouldn't be surprised if it's 100,000 Satoshis in 20 years' time. There is a market for 8 billion people that not only are going to want Bitcoin, they're going to need Bitcoin. This is where the information asymmetry plays in really nicely with you know, Bitcoiners is that we understand that everyone is going to need this at some point in time in the future. The best risk versus reward era of, of Bitcoin ever. While larger pools of capital are accessing this market, you now have less and less Bitcoin available to purchase. At some point in time, we are going to have this elastic band absolutely snap and then we'll see a god candle. Bitcoin is the best form of collateral ever invented. So you're going to get rewarded with the best loan terms, the cheapest interest rate, the best credit term, and you'll be able to go to any bank on earth that's offering you those best before we start into the topic with real estate and why bitcoin is such a great collateral um, and how it uh, stacks up against a, a real estate i want to just quickly ask you because it has been i think around half a year since our last conversation on the podcast what was like your your highlight in the past couple of months i think five or six months it has been in the last five or six months i would say the Trojan horse into Wall Street that is the ETF. Wall Street's got no idea what it's got itself in for. They think they're going to control this beast. Um, They don't understand that this is just the start of something that's going to completely redefine what Wall Street is, the products they've got, how they operate. And to me, I can see the makings of one of the biggest if not the biggest financial product on earth with the ETFs and what that brings to the markets. Um, If you understand the backing and the background of Larry Fink and what he started with the tokenization of the real estate, residential real estate market back in the early 80s or mid 80s with his uh, residential mortgage backed securities, um, he effectively brings tokenization to money, uh, which he hasn't been able to achieve as yet. Obviously he's tokenized bonds, he's world's largest investor or fund manager but what he brings with Bitcoin and the the ability to tokenize that through the ETFs and then what that means from a downstream uh, product perspective, uh, boy, oh boy, it's just opened the floodgates, but they don't know what they're in for yet, but they're, uh, yeah, they're- Really, really interesting. Um, Yeah, and let's directly jump into the topic. Um, Why do you think is Bitcoin such an pristine collateral uh, and especially stacks up against uh, real estate so good? It's a really deep question and I appreciate you having me on to talk about this. The The real estate market has been a huge success for the last 40 or 50 years and you need to have a look at that in context to what has been achieved in the credit markets that have supported that. And if you break down what makes a good investment in the real estate side of things, um, there's a whole host of factors that go into assessing whether or not a property deal is going to be a good one. And the fundamental, there are sort of some key drivers that move the market more so than anything else. And if we take a really, what, what I was going to suggest is we take a really high level and look at what are the key drivers for property and then we actually dig down into it and then see how that compares and relates to Bitcoin. Because I think a lot of the, the property developers, property investors, full stop, don't really understand or comprehend the similar, similarities that, they, that Bitcoin holds to the real estate sector and maybe doing a deep dive and comparison in that from all of the factors that we look at from a a real estate side of things and compare that to the Bitcoin side of things, we'll we'll actually get those investors a whole lot closer to understanding what we see when it comes to Bitcoin. But if I make a start on a really high level, the, the first thing that the real estate sector does really well, particularly in Western democracies, is it affords people property rights. So there's obviously, without property rights, we actually have no way of investing long-term capital. So the provision of property rights is fundamental. And it's it really is a given that we need to have uh, property rights before we can actually invest any money in, in, in anywhere. Um, to, to look at this from a high level perspective, when we're looking at, you know, say the stock markets across the globe, there are some stock markets that we just will not invest any money into because we're not concerned about a return on capital, we're, we're more concerned about a return off capital. And I sort of look to the fact that we haven't invested in the Chinese market for a number of years. Um, we, we never got comfortable with the rule of law there. And that 
that that's an instant dismissal from an investment decision if if you can't get comfortable with being able to not only get your money in you need to be able to get your money out when you want to as well and unfortunately it looks like the chinese market is a one-way valve that it's okay to put money in but it's very difficult getting money out and this is where um, on, on a real estate perspective uh, we want to invest in markets that not only allow us to put capital in but allow us the return of our capital so i think property rights is a fundamental base layer of what we need to look to when we're looking at the comparison of, of Bitcoin to real estate. And this is really interesting from a, a real estate perspective. All of our um, economies that we work in and invest in have got very good property rights. They've got land titles office. They've got rules and regulations around that. They've got very good guidance. They've got great uh, clarity around who is the owner of the title of these deeds that we need to actually invest and purchase those properties. And it also shows the caveats and the loans, the liens that are against those properties. This is kind of a critical piece of infrastructure that we need to look at because it also shows the state of, of the property and, and what's what kind of financial state that's in. <clears throat> the interesting thing when you compare that to Bitcoin is to me, Bitcoin fundamentally exports those property rights to anyone who has access to the Bitcoin network in that you're provided those those very same property rights that are outstanding and excellent that we you know, want to invest in, in say, you know, the US, Europe, uh, Australia and the like. Um, but that can be accessed with Bitcoin anywhere in the world. And, and I look at this and I think the property rights are afforded are basically given through, I guess, a number of different ways. And that is government policies, incentives and tax breaks. Are there uh, the abilities to take on subsidies or tax breaks for, for making certain investments? And this is where a government can either promote or um, discourage investment in a certain certain area. Now, I look at um, property investment in the US. They've got opportunity zones where, you know, fairly uh, run down, beat out areas of you know the city are basically afforded opportunity zones where you can invest money with discounted tax breaks and subsidies, all sorts of in incentives to clean up that area and and make investments there. Interestingly. Bitcoin doesn't have that. It's just a great opportunity for everyone. But the, the interesting thing about this is the government can influence decisions in these in these real estate decisions to try and either bring up the property market or alternatively push that property market down. So not only can offer incentives to do that, they can offer disincentives by changing the zoning of a property that may be zoned for a 40 story commercial office block. If they rezone that to parkland, you've effectively taken away the intrinsic value of that property. And so you are subject to the whim of that government as to whether or not they like you. Now, it's a pretty rare occurrence in the Western world that that happens, but that's a very real problem that you need to be be aware of when, when you're investing large sums. It's really interesting. Also, when you think about, uh, I never thought about that, but when you think about tax treatments, I know in Austria, there are a lot of beneficial tax treatments from the government to real estate uh, so like uh, a lot of tax advisors even like hey if you have overflow cash flow put something in real estate do some deals with that, with that because there are a lot of incentives uh, to just put money in real estate the government really incentivize that but what happens if the government realizes hey we, we want as many bitcoin as, as possible in our country and put all those tax benefits that we formerly had on real estate and now to the Bitcoin. It's an, it's an interesting thought to, to think about. Yeah, the, the interesting things I look at from an incentive structure that I'm aware of across the globe, in Australia, and I'm sure across a whole host of countries, you've got incentive for first home buyers that they'll not only avoid um, having to pay stamp duty or on cost to purchase the property, they will give you a cash handout to buy that. And typically the banks will also give you a much higher uh, percentage loan against a first home as opposed to a, a much higher value property. So these are sort of the subtle cues that the government gives you that want you investing in that sort of investment and or, or taking on that type of responsibility. And this is where uh, there's also tax incentives. The, there are huge tax incentives in the US that help you avoid capital gains tax. Uh, 1031 allows you to effectively leapfrog from property, 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 property without having to pay capital gains tax along the way. So you can leverage, you know, from one small property, buy it, hold it, sell it, and reinvest that into the next property without having to pay capital gains tax and have your investments diluted. That's a huge incentive for anyone looking to build a, 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 
a portfolio and build their wealth as quickly as possible because you avoid the capital gains tax, which is typically somewhere between 20 to 40 percent across across the globe. Imagine every five years you had your wealth taxed by 40 percent because you had to pay capital gains tax. Now, that 1031 in the US is a huge benefit to anyone who's looking to take advantage of that, because not only do you get to leverage the property by borrowing on the property in credit, and we'll get to you know how that affects real estate investments, but you also get to leverage the fact that you're not going to pay capital gains tax and you can defer that. Well, you're going to pay it, but you're going to defer it and you get to keep deferring that the whole way along the way until you come to the end of your run and, and need to sell the property and don't want to reinvest it in that. So there are so many um, levers that the government can pull to incentivize property. And I look at this and I think this is what, what our Western democracies are effectively built on is really good property rights and the governments have highly incentivized us to invest in property, whether that's through tax break subsidies, cashbacks, tax incentives, um, or a whole host of other measures. And one of the things that you know, a lot of Australian investors do, and um, I'm sure it's available to you know, most of Europe and, and the US is uh, negative gearing in that if you buy a property and you heavily gear that property, or you borrow heavily on that property and the rent doesn't meet the repayment, um, that difference plus whatever other costs are incurred in holding that property for the year um, are allowed to be deducted from your taxable income. So all of a sudden it's highly, it incentivizes you highly to take on debt to be negatively geared and have that property costing you money because it comes straight off your taxable income. You use that as a tax deduction. And then at the same time, you've got the capital growth of the property going up at the same time. And that's why a lot of property investors get fabulously wealthy because you have the ability to minimise your income tax, which is typically taxed at 50% for the highest income taxpayers. And you get to put your, your gains, your returns into the capital growth of the property, which is taxed at 25%. So from an investor's perspective, and this is where you need to look at total return, do you want to be taxed at 25% and have the ability to defer that tax basically ad infinitum into the future, never, never put it on the never, never account that you never really pay it? Or do you want to pay 50% of your income every year trying to get ahead? And this is where, to me, property has worked really well for that perspective. And I think Bitcoin has the ability to work even better when you look at it in the con broader context of what makes a good real estate investment and you compare apples to apples on that front. Yeah, this, this was my, my next question. Do you think that same playbook, maybe also with debt uh, as Bitcoin as collateral and you get like a fiat uh, debt on that, is the same playbook also suitable for, for Bitcoin? I mean, the only difference that I see is real estate has an income. You have renters in there. Uh, you, you can't, nobody can live in the Bitcoin, but it's way better as an asset itself. So uh, it kind of like uh, it's probably better. I think it's really important to understand what makes a good property investment. And the, the thing that we look at, you know, beyond property rights that makes a good property investment, we want to make sure that there is a demographic trend heading to that area that we're looking to invest in. So is there a flow of people that are going to come to the area that are going to build out infrastructure, that are going to build out amenities, employments, you know, all of these sort of X factors that are very difficult to determine. But if you understand what you're looking at, you know, you can identify those things. I, I look at that and compare that to the relative opportunity with Bitcoin. And I think property is very well understood. It's very easy to calculate and we can, we can see what demographics are headed to certain areas. So we can determine pretty well what the capital growth of certain areas are going to be relative to others. And then we can make a calculated, I guess, guess or assumptions about what are going to be the return and the risk profile of, of that investment. What's interesting I see about Bitcoin is that what a lot of people don't really understand is that I, I feel that there is that, well, there is a market for 8 billion people that not only are going to want Bitcoin, they're going to need Bitcoin. And when you put this in, you know, in real estate terms, what, what does that actually equate to? Well, there's 21 million Bitcoin and there's 8 billion people. So what that effectively represents, if we were talking about an area um, like a, a property, a, a land deal, there are 21 million acres and every single person on earth, if they were given an equal share, would have 
roughly three square metres of space. Now, I look at that and think, if I know there are going to be 8 billion people that are vying for this piece of land that's magical, that everyone is going to need, it's not, it's, it's not a want, it's not a nice to have, they're going to have to have it, they just don't know it yet, and there's th roughly three square metres for every person, I look at this and think, well, that's the kind of property investment that I want to be making. And this is where the information asymmetry plays in really nicely with you know, Bitcoiners, is that we understand that everyone is going to need this at some point in time in the future. But not every real estate owner, um, developer uh, or investor understands the, the requirement that they're going to need this in the future. And therein lies the opportunity that once the rest of the world figures out what this is, they're going to need to effectively buy as much of this as they can. And the problem with this is, unlike any other piece of land in the world, is there's only 21 million acres. There's only 21 million Bitcoin. We can't produce any more of that. It is a it is a hard cap on 21 million. So regardless of how hard people try, there's no ability for us to either build a second layer on top of this. There's, and I say that as far as in, in terms of you know land acquisition, um, there's no ability for us to reclaim land in the in the harbour like Hong Kong did to build out a runway. Um, there's no ability for us to drive piles of sand into the ocean like Dubai did to build the palms. We're set, we're stuck. There's 21 million acres or 21 million Bitcoin and that is it. We can't go up, we can't build on top of it. It's just going to be flat land. So think of trying to fit 8 billion people into that 21, 21 million acres. Basically, we have three square metres each. And, and the real thing about this, which sort of just it, it beggars belief and still find it hard to process, is that we can go and buy that three square metres, that one Bitcoin, now for circa 60,000 US dollars. And I know there's going to be 8 billion people on that plot of land in the next 20 years. That's amazing. And I, th I think uh, we, we, saw, we see this trend already starting. I had in the last three weeks... Uh, two people on uh, that were formerly real estate investors and now shifted the last, uh, what was it, two and a half years, all the properties into Bitcoin. They're like, we, we don't want it. It's a headache. Uh, it's, it's you have to care for it. There's like a toilet not working. You have to care for that. Like there's like a lot of headaches coming with real estate and they want to have the best collateral. And it's really interesting uh, how you how you explain it because once you like understand or oh, everyone needs to have Bitcoin at some point, it's like, it's like the world will be forced to live in an area and you can now buy a piece of that area and you know 8 billion people, maybe more at that time, uh, maybe we get make more babies and more people, maybe we even uh, get, get to space and, and, and find new species, but that's, that's another topic. Uh, and they all want to live in that area and they all want a piece of that. That's... Uh, that's um, <laughs> amazing opportunity to have now you know, to get like a, a million sats for uh, a, a few uh, what is it million sats a thousand euros or not even a uh, thousand euros so like that's a, an amazing opportunity to have and it's it's really really great to, to have that and now um with with the playbook of real estate do you think uh, people will um, start loaning uh, lending out their bitcoin as collateral to to make that play and, and and pay for things because as as you said like if you sell your bitcoin or you spend your bitcoin right now there's a lot of taxes involved in in most of the areas of of, of the world some some don't have taxes some have taxes on that um is the best strategy just like get like, uh, I don't know, uh, one-tenth of your Bitcoin, take it as collateral and, and get a, a US dollar loan or euro loan or whatever loan uh, to pay, pay for your bills and don't have to sell your Bitcoin as everyone wants to live there? Without wanting to give any personal financial advice, I find it very difficult selling Bitcoin, knowing full well that there's 8 billion people about to head into this piece of land that and they're going to want to, they're going to, want to buy it and they're going, to, they're going to pay a premium for it. And... For me, when it comes to offering Bitcoin up as collateral, if we take a step back on this and, and look at the real estate market over the last 40 or 50 years, particularly across any, any of um, the Western countries, has seen unprecedented growth. And the reason for that, there's multiple different reasons for that. And, but if I go through it, the major reason, um, obviously, is the, the, the ability to, to purchase there were demographics behind it. So there were people there who wanted 
wanted to buy land, build families, and you know, our population grew. That's the first one. The second one is that there was an availability of credit. And this is something that I don't think people really comprehend was the reason why we've had such a huge boom in property. And when you couple that, um, the, the credit policies that have changed over the last 50 years, and I'll run through a couple of examples of that, um, and how that has, has been, um, how that's had tailwinds of basically interest rates going down for the last 40 years, that has been a perfect storm to push the value of that, of that collateral, i.e. the real estate property market, up substantially. And just to give you an example of how much credit has influenced um, these property prices over the last 40 years, uh, I, I just want to give you an example of what property used to look, or property credit on property used to look like back in the 1970s versus what it looks like today. So if you were uh, wanting to go and purchase a new home back in the 1970s, you had to come up with roughly 50% of the deposit. So you had to save, you know, for a number of years to come up with that deposit. And then you would go to the bank and they would assess you on whether or not you were capable of purchasing that. Now, interest rates were far higher than what they are now. And the other interesting thing is, is that this was at, at a time um, when the introduction, and I, I don't want to um, sound narrow-minded or myopic in this, but um, you know, women in the workforce was a relatively new thing. Um, it had only been around for say 15 to 20 years um, on the back of you know the expansion in the 60, 50s and 60s of women entering the workforce. And what was interesting about the credit policies is that they were very, um, they were, they were very um, <clears throat> dismissive of women wanting to take out loans. And if you're a single woman wanting to borrow to buy a property, a lot of the time you were knocked back because they they were they were very unfair policies. They just flat out refused to give women loans because they didn't want to take the risk because they thought that they would be unreliable in paying and they'd want to start a family and then they wouldn't be able to meet their commitment. So that's where we were 40, 50 years ago. Things have changed dramatically from then until now in that now all you have to do to buy a property in Australia anyway is come up with 5% of the value of the property. So you need to come up with now 10% of what you used to come up with back in the 1970s. So you only come up with a small fraction of what you need and then you borrow 95%. So what does that do? All of a sudden, just by default, that is going to raise the prices of property dramatically because now all of a sudden, a whole host of people can actually save enough money to go and buy a property. Now, the other sort of fuel to the fire on this one is, is that when you take interest rates from 18% down to 0%, all of a sudden, you now make that cost of that 95% loan on the property effectively nothing relative to what that is. So what does that do? The lowering of interest rates effectively, you know, pushes, puts a, a bonfire under the, the value of the property and basically forces the property up dramatically in value. And just like we're starting to see now where we've now seen for the first time in 40 years, interest rates actually start to go up over the last two years, we've seen a flattening out relative in the property market. So I look at that and think <clears throat> Bitcoin has all of these things to look forward to when it comes to tailwinds, collateral, all of these things are going to be coming to Bitcoin. And I look at this as an investing opportunity that we're going to have Bitcoin treated as the best form of collateral. So for the last 50 years, we've seen residential property and property in general treated as the best form of collateral. And what has that meant? If you had the best form of collateral, you got the cheapest interest rates, you got to borrow the most against any other relative to any other asset, you got the most preferable loan terms. And what that meant was that you can basically pour more money into it and you can hold on to equity so you could then go and buy another property. And I look at this and I think um, with a background in credit and looking at how Bitcoin rates relative to property, residential or commercial in terms of a collateral, I look at this and think, Bitcoin is hands down infinitely better than the collateral that we've got in residential property and commercial property. But that is misunderstood by the markets. And this is why when you ask me to start um, the conversation, what are you excited about? This is where the Trojan horses ended Wall Street. And these products are coming to market. 
Now, Larry Fink was instrumental in getting the tokenization of the residential property market in the form of the residential mortgage-backed securities. And I think he's going to redo that playbook with Bitcoin through the ETFs. Is that all? Maybe I'm living in a bubble, but I hear so many great news about Bitcoin and maybe that there's like so much, so, such a storm now coming. Like we have all the buckets already out for Bitcoin. There's like the, the playbook for uh, corporations laid out by MicroStrategy, a lot already followed. We have the playbook for even nation states with, with El Salvador, even though they have only a, a small Bitcoin reserve with like, I don't know, four or five percent of their reserves, but still they have. Uh, then we have like real estate. Uh, playbooks where they come we have the etfs with all those different fundamental buckets that are already laid out and it seems like we are uh, in for like um, a gold rush era for for bitcoin the next like couple 10 20 years where where it's probably not only going up but they're like there will be a boom and bust cycles of course along the way and volatility i guess um, but do, do you think that we are now in that area where it's so obvious but still 99% of the people still don't get it. And, and like right now, I feel like it's the, the best risk uh, versus reward uh, era of, of Bitcoin ever uh, because it's already so obvious. It's, it's always so, so proven and we have still so much growth in front of us. I agree with that wholeheartedly. They're, on a risk-adjusted basis, I've never seen a better time to be investing in Bitcoin because you now have a lot of the downside risk protected. You now have regulatory authority in the form of SEC approval. And whether we like it or not, the SEC sets the agenda for the world. So you in Europe, myself in Australia, we're just, we're minions relative to the US and what they determine. So they've already given their, their stamp of approval to ensure that there is going to be regulatory clarity on that. That's a huge step forward. I look at, um, on a risk adjusted basis, Bitcoin trading at $60,000. It's such an inconsequential market in global terms of one point one to $1.2 trillion. There's you know, $100 trillion of funds under advice globally that needs to enter this market in some way, shape or form. It's now got the regulatory approval, which now allows larger pools of capital to put, put money to work. And while larger pools of capital are accessing this market, you now have less and less Bitcoin available to purchase. So at some point in time, we are going to have this elastic band absolutely snap and then we'll see a god candle, a mega candle, whatever you want to call it at some point in time. But to your point about the, the playbooks have all been laid out. Michael Saylor has been instrumental and what he's done is absolutely genius from a, from, a, from a business perspective. He's effectively created a money printing machine in the form of issuing shares to go and buy Bitcoin. And although he, he dilutes his shareholders by in terms of units, of his company, it is actually accretive in Bitcoin to each of those those unit holders. So it is an absolutely fabulous playbook. The best part is is that he gets to arbitrage that risk to the upside when the Bitcoin's well when his stock is trading at a premium to the book value that he believes it is. He can issue shares to bring that back down to fair market value. And then if for whatever reason his stock is trading at a discount relative to market. He then gets to issue convertible bonds. So tails he wins, loses, like, you know, tails he wins, heads he wins. It's like he just has found a way to do what Charlie Sheen did in by winning. Like he can't lose with that strategy. Um, don't want to give him the kiss of death, but it, it's an outstanding strategy that I look at and think, why aren't more people doing it? We've seen MetaPlanet in Japan and um, similar scientific, um, you know, pick up the, the baton and run with it. But these are great ideas that take a huge amount of understanding and learning before it can be implemented. And there are so many hurdles to overcoming that, that good ideas really need to be rammed down people's throats. You know, Michael Saylor was <laughs> terrified that when he figured out what Bitcoin was, that someone was going to beat him to it. So he spent basically three days buying $3,000 lots of Bitcoin to, to get his, you know, 100, 200, 300 million dollar position, initial position in Bitcoin. And he was terrified that someone would beat him to it and just put a lump sum order in and then set the price at whatever the price would be. And and this is where, despite all this groundwork being done and the playbooks being out there, whether it's a real estate, you know, stock market, bond market, you name it, it's all out there. But there are going to be very few people who actually pick it up and run with it. And it's just going to be a late a late start for a lot of people and the, 
the crowd will relate to this. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin, keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your Bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship set up you have to talk to the bitcoin way if you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable or your digital footprint in general is secure they are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing coin vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way it's uh, i love the comparison he made in in the podcast with me uh, a couple uh, months ago where he said like if you have the cure for cancer you still have to sell it like <laughs> people are uh, skeptical at first even if you if, if you have someone that has cancer and you have the cure for cancer it will still take them time to like oh but does it really cure my cancer or does it is it what about the side effects? Oh, can, can I can I afford it? Like all those questions in the head, and it's like uh, we have this pristine collateral. We have this amazing asset with Bitcoin, and it's uh, once you dive deeper in it, it's it's so obvious. Uh, yeah, like you, you never meet an informed critic that actually has no Bitcoin. There are some informed critics who have like five, ten percent of Bitcoin because. Even the critics are like, oh, that, there might be a chance it catches on. Like, like even the, the 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 I think even like people like Peter Schiff, I think even he has some Bitcoin. I think there's no way he has no Bitcoin. Like at least some he has to get because he's seen how how wrong he was since Bitcoin was like two dollars. So like there's no way he has no Bitcoin. Uh, so th that's an uh, that's an amazing thing, and there's no one shorting it uh, long term that is successful because they would be bankrupt till now. Uh, so it's a really interesting uh, topic, and I want to buy. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say to that analogy about you can't sell a cure to can like you can't give away a cure to cancer. You've got to sell it. You know who are the people who are buying that cure to cancer and aren't asking questions? The people who need it. In the same way that the people who need Bitcoin will just buy it and they're not going to ask questions. They're, and, and the sad part is, is that the people who need Bitcoin, there are 8 billion people who need it, but maybe a million people understand that they actually need it. So I know there's going to be 8 billion people who need it, um, just like that cure for cancer, but it's not until you need it that you are going to take action to actually understand it and then take massive action to to implement this across whatever you know whatever assets you've got to deploy into this space so i find that highly amusing that the cure for cancer is only sold to the person who needs it not wants it oh yeah i'm skeptical i don't believe it cures cancer and you know whatever but if you've got cancer and you've got someone telling you you've got a cure for it <laughs> you're not asking what the side effects are you're not asking how much it costs you're just saying just give me the fucking thing <laughs> That's the, that's actually true. Yeah. It's interesting for me because like when I go into the gym, I see mostly fit people. When when you go to a car wash, there are usually cars that are already 
quite good. Like they don't have to <laughs> be in a car wash. They're, like people that regularly go to the car wash, they have a clean car. Uh, so like there, there's this thing, and and also in in my uh, friendships where I see no coiners who adopt a Bitcoin, there's the most mostly people that don't really need it right now. They 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 live a good life, and uh, they they not the ones that are suffering financially right now. Uh, but they are the ones who adopt it. It's, it's interesting that like, um, and people that uh, only live on fear, they live month to month. Uh, they, the, the people that need it the most, or even like people in, in Africa, I mean, we have in Nigeria the highest adoption rate. So like that, that's that's like a little bit against that. But uh, I think people who, who need it really uh, in, in, Af- in countries like Nigeria or El Salvador, they adopt it. But then there are this, this, this middle class who doesn't, doesn't see the pain they, they will experience really soon and they would need it uh, um, the most and they would uh, benefit from it also the most, like the, the small companies, the, the the individuals who have a little bit of cash uh, on their hands, like maybe they have like 20,000 euros laying around. They would probably benefit the most from it uh, when adopting them. And this is also like the, the biggest part and the biggest chunk of that. Like Bitcoin is either get by people to actually do a lot of research in finance or by the people who <laughs> already are in pain, uh, like in Nigeria, in El Salvador uh, and all those places. It's, it's, it's fascinating to see the, the adoption running, but we are still at like so early. And there was uh, one guy, I think he's all, I think he's uh, also on the Bitcoin advisory board. I forgot his name. I'm, I'm, he was two times already on my podcast. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> Wait, Edited back uh, in. <laughs> Uh, oh shit! <laughs> I forgot his name. In real estate, he's big. Uh, Leon, Leon Wanken. Uh, no, I, I'm sorry. I, I will think about it uh, a little bit later. But he basically said he thinks that even at a million dollar Bitcoin price, ninety percent of people will still don't get it, and ninety yeah. percent will st- still don't have uh, uh, got Bitcoin. But it will be already at a million dollars because the big money will will come in. Uh, do you also see uh, the the point where the people with they have already uh, then all all of a the sudden they get cancer, all of a the sudden they need Bitcoin? When is that moment of like mass retail FOMO coming? Is it like past a million? Like what what more do do the the masses need as a as a Bitcoin price as as an action or an event that happens? Doesn't it has to be in price? Maybe it's an event that happens that people are like, oh shit, now we have to adopt Bitcoin. I think it's a I think it's a government scale event. It's not a it's not a bottom up mass awakening where people you know a million people wake up and say hey I've got to buy a million dollars of it and just jams the price up. I think we end up we we go to bed we wake up one day and then we wake up to a, a price of Bitcoin being set at a million dollars US. It jumps ten x overnight and people are wondering well what just happened. It's like well. A central banker with uh, an ability to print money by literally holding his finger on the zero key has the ability to buy an unlimited amount of Bitcoin or whatever is on the exchange. And the funny thing about this is, is this th- this is the money glitch. They have a zero cost of production for their money. And currently, Bitcoin costs roughly $52,000 per Bitcoin to produce. Now, I'm no trader, but if I'm a central banker and realize that, hey, that costs fifty two thousand dollars worth of electricity and all in cost to produce, and I can print fifty two thousand dollars for nothing. A very smart central banker, a forward thinker, is going to say, "You know what? I'm just going to hold my money, you know, my finger down on the money printer. I'm going to print as much of this as I can, and I'm just going to buy and keep buying until people get exhausted of selling. And then what will happen is the price will just continue to move up. It'll get to a level that they they're going to continue to buy at." And that sets the foundation of a new floor. I've got no doubt that will happen. We're not going to have a mass awakening of a billion people who say, hey, we've got to have it. And they go to, you know, their exchange one day and buy it and send it to the top. That's not how this is going to work. This is going to work from a top down. Someone with a money printer is just going to say, you know what? I've seen the playbook. I've seen the best performing, you know, asset on on earth for the last 15 years is Bitcoin. I've seen the best performing stock in the last four years is MicroStrategy. I'm going to buy some of that. And I'm going to put my country as the first country that, holds holds as much Bitcoin as possible. That's how it works in, in my mind. And then for me, how this is going to play out in the long term is when people understand that this is the best form of collateral ever invented, 
you're going to be able to take this collateral to any bank on earth. And I look at this and I think we've got or had experience with clients in the past, particularly in the early 90s. I was a bit too young for this, but heard the war stories um, on the back of this. In the early 90s in Australia, we had interest rates around 18%. But you could go and get a foreign exchange loan with Singapore or Switzerland, where you would pay 12 to 13%. So you were reducing your interest payable by roughly 30% by taking out a loan with another foreign bank. Now, the problem with that is, is that you had an exchange rate risk that if the US dollar dropped in value or the Aussie dollar dropped in value relative to that currency that you bought it or that you borrowed it, then you had to make up the difference. And a lot of people got caught out and ended up going bust because they exposed themselves to a foreign currency that they, they didn't understand the risk of. Now, they were trying to save 5% on their mortgage repayment um, and they ended up going broke because of the foreign exchange rate risk associated with this. Now, the reason why I bring that up is because Bitcoin as a globally ubiquitous pristine collateral allows you to go to any bank on earth will want to take the underlying asset that is Bitcoin. Now, ironically, they're not going to want to take the underlying asset of an ETF because the ETF comes with all the encumbrances of whatever country that it's listed in. So you're not going to be able to take your uh, IBIT, you know, BlackRock ETF Bitcoin to the Reserve Bank of Japan because they're going to look at you and say, what good is this to us? We, we can't use this because it's got the encumbrance of encumbrances of being listed on the nasdaq it's got all of the problems associated with you know the us securities law that they have to deal with and there's no way for them to hold it and have any control over it when you pair that with having the underlying you'll be able to go to the bank of japan and say hey i've got a bitcoin it's globally ubiquitous so it's the same all over the world they'll look at that and say yeah i'll i'll take that i'd like that and they'll give you a rate that's lower than anywhere else on earth that you can borrow from. That's at this point in time. And so I look at this and think, you don't have, you've got the ability to get the best terms when you have the best best collateral and Bitcoin is the best form of collateral ever invented. So you're gonna get rewarded with the best loan terms, the cheapest interest rate, the best credit terms, and you'll be able to go to any bank on earth that's offering you those best terms because it's ubiquitous all over the globe. So it's the same everywhere you go. But if I turned up to say an Austrian bank with an Australian title deed for my property, you boys are gonna laugh me out of the bank. It's like, what on earth do we want your Australian title deed? It may as well be a tissue or a toilet paper. It means the same thing in Austria. But if I turned up to an Austrian bank with a Bitcoin, that's completely different. And this is where, you know, having seen experiences with clients who have suffered that foreign exchange risk in their borrowing and in, in an attempt to get a lower interest rate by taking on foreign currency risk. The ironic thing about using Bitcoin as collateral is that you get to experience the best interest rates on the best terms and you preclude yourself from ever having any foreign currency risk in the borrowing that you take on because you've got one asset in Bitcoin that's denominated in every currency on it. That's super interesting, the global aspect of it, because you just take it everywhere. I think in Austria, uh, a friend of mine told me you don't even have to give them the Bitcoin to get a loan. You just have to give them your, your public keys and uh, they, are, they are fine with that, <laughs> apparently. <Wow. laughs> Please send them my details. <laughs> I'd like to talk to them. <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, see, I uh, have this public key. <laughs> Uh, but probably you have to somehow prove that you also have the private key. But uh, I, yeah, I have to check it out once uh, as I'm I'm in Austria. I have to see it. I I came up with the name Ratchet Sony. Uh, so, sorry, nice. Ratchet. <laughs> oh, Ratchet. Um, Genius. Um, he was already two times on my show. I was also one time on on his show. It's it's really cool uh, talking with him uh, every time. Um, He's a I great guy. Circle. I want to circle back one time more to the real estate uh, because one aspect that we did not cover till now is, and I think a lot of people are not aware or don't think about that uh, that aspect of it, real estate is already crashing really hard against Bitcoin. Like yeah. when, uh, when you see the, how is the site called, priced in, in Bitcoin 21, I think is the site, where you can see the average US and UK home prices and five years ago, it was around 30 Bitcoin, and now it's around five, six Bitcoin, the average home price. 
uh, and it's already like from 30 to five, it's, it's like a massive crash already in five years. Um, and now my question, a little bit speculative, but maybe you have a framework to think about it. What do you think, how, how much Satoshis do, does someone now need to accumulate to buy an, an home in like 20 years? When we see that trend continuing, like now you need like 500 million Satoshis, uh, but it's already crashing down a, a lot from this uh, 32 Bitcoin. What do you think is like an, uh, a rough estimate for yours like to buy a home? Because I'm really interested in measuring Bitcoin, not in US dollars, but measuring Bitcoin in like, oh, how much kilograms of gold can I buy? How much land can I buy? How much real estate can I buy? I think it makes way more sense to measure Bitcoin against something real and not something uh, a feared. Yeah, I, I, I think if we're going to assume that um, an average European home price is going to be a million euros, uh, I'm not sure what it is now, but I presume it's substantially lower than that. I would have thought across the board, um, you know, Euro European Union is a big place, but if I can speculate that it's circa 500,000 euro now, and I presume it's probably a lot lower if you consider that you've got Portugal and Spain, you've got Greece and Italy as well in that. Um, you know, German, Germany and Austria are, and France are probably the most well healed in that crew. So I think 500,000 would be very generous across the board of the EU. I think in the next 20 years, um, an average European home price is gonna be you know, roughly a million, a million euro. And I think you're going to be able to get that for 0 0.001 of a Bitcoin. So I think it's going to be uh, roughly a million Satoshis. I, I like that number, million Satoshis, because it's, yeah. uh, uh, it's, it's also with becoming a millionaire. This is something so, so big in, the, in, in people's head and becoming a Satoshi millionaire. I think it, it will get, get to a bigger state again. And I think... Uh, Becoming a millionaire becomes less and less interesting <laughs> because a million gets diluted more and more. It was way, way more interesting like 20 years ago. Now you, you have to be a decker millionaire and stuff like that. So I think uh, a million satoshis is really uh, a, a good amount. Um, now, one more question before we come to the end routine. Do you see any challenges or hurdles uh, coming along the way for, for Bitcoin adoption? Yeah, I do. I think it's just... A completely misunderstood asset. I think volatility is going to continue to scare people. And I don't think there's a solution to that volatility problem. And a lot of people get scared about Bitcoin's volatility and they think it's a bug, but they don't understand the volatility is the feature. That's the ability for Bitcoin to be worth a hundred million or a billion on that a revision of that, you know, how much is a home going to cost? I wouldn't be surprised if it's a hundred thousand Satoshis in 20 years time. And that seems completely insane, but relative to where everyone is right now and you know, the need that is going to come for Bitcoin. I, I don't think that's outrageous to think whatsoever, but there is going to be some people who are going to go out on the risk curve who need Bitcoin, who have to take the risk because they don't have any other options. And this is where, you know, if I look at the demographics for investing in real estate v Bitcoin, real estate's over. You've got the generation which holds all the wealth owning 80, 90% of the real estate. Now, the generations who are going to inherit that wealth, the millennials, Gen Zs, what have you, they're not interested in owning huge homes and tying up a huge amount of capital to that. That's not what they're about. They're about experiences. They're about having flexibility, optionality, and having all of your assets tied up in a huge home. You know, making huge generalizations here isn't as appealing as having you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 Bitcoin at your disposal and being able to rent that lifestyle for pennies on the dollar. And I'll give you an example here. If you want to, in Australia, if you want to hold or purchase a, a really nice home, it's going to cost you circa $10 million in the part of the world that I am. And you're going to have a stamp duty to purchase that property, which is a government tax that they levy on you just to purchase it. They're going to charge you close to seven hundred to $800,000 just to purchase it in a one-off fee. So it's going to cost you, call it, $11 million to purchase that property. Um, you can finance maybe 50% of it. So you're going to have a $5 million loan on it. That $5 million loan is going to be at a rate of 6 or 7%. That 7% on 500000 is going to cost you $350,000 a year. Um, and you can't claim that as a tax deduction. And that's how much it's going to cost you to own it. It's going to cost you $5 million or $6 million in equity 
plus a $5 million mortgage that's going to cost you $350,000 a year. Alternatively, you can just rent that lifestyle and you can pay 1% to 2% of the value of that property and you can rent that. So I look at the Gen Z, you know, and I look at that and think, why would they pay, you know, $5 million plus $350,000 a year just to own that property when they can rent that lifestyle for $200,000 a year and they can save the $5 million, put that into Bitcoin and they can have a return of 50% on that per annum. So they're making $2.5 million a year investing it in Bitcoin and it's saving them $150,000 in running costs per annum on the property, yet they get the same result. I just look at this and I think the, the, the baby boomers don't understand what's coming down the road. There's no one coming to buy their big properties or not the, the level that's needed to maintain those values. So what needs to happen? You either need to get really loose credit policies with really low interest rates to maintain those property values. Or alternatively, you just move to an investment where the demographics and the population are in your favour. And I, you know, by my calculations, there may be a million people on that little Bitcoin island right now. And there's going to be 8 billion people there in the next 20 years. So where do you want your money? Where the people are going to be? That's crazy. So you're saying there's a, a 7% buying tax on property? Yes. Yes, there is. So a, an example I did for a client just the other day on a $7.5 million property was going to cost them $450,000 in stamp duty. Uh, that's crazy for me. Plus, plus, if it's an investment property, they're going to charge a 1% plus uh, land tax on that property per annum. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that's there it. are just multiple reasons why you don't really want to be in that investment relative to Bitcoin. Yeah, it's like if you have to pay a tax per year to the government, you don't own that property. <laughs> you don't. No. Yeah, absolutely don't do that. That's, uh, I think we, we covered a lot of points uh, about real estate versus Bitcoin and why it's a good idea to stick with Bitcoin and not do real estate. I, one small personal uh, story from me. I was actually going to buy my first property before I bought Bitcoin. And then I discovered Bitcoin and never bought, purchased the first property. And I'm so glad I discovered Bitcoin. I'm just so glad I, I went into Bitcoin uh, and not in the real estate area. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's a, a small nugget for me. And I'm just so, so happy uh, that I, to that time, found Michael Saylor and all the other ones that, that Orange built me through the so many podcasts that were out there and one of uh, my pot, uh, my motivations also to, to put a podcast out a day because there, there will be some people out there that uh, have a life-changing experience from a podcast and that's uh, that's uh, that's all uh, that, that uh, needs to happen and then it's, it's really cool thank you um we have a new end routine uh, that came uh, between last time you we were on until now um where i ask one question uh, that is challenging the the, the guests to think of something they can teach the audience that has not been uh, talked about on the podcast already. So the question is, what can we learn from you besides all the things that we already uh, talked about? Oh, that's a very good question. And I've got to pull you up on the question that you asked me last time it was an absolute shocker. I don't know if you remember that or not. <laughs> I, I I even I even uh, um, I mentioned it on the podcast after the shooting of of Trump uh, that uh, you brought up the question uh, you got the question you brought up your answer that if he is alive uh, and I brought oh. it actually in 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 the podcast I did after the assassination at have so like if you want to watch it uh, you you mentioned it in there because <laughs> oh, the question was and I thought it was just such a nasty question who's gonna win the election and why I was like. I don't have a dog in that fight, but um, boy, oh boy, that was quite a prescient answer. Um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. I love that. So what can I teach or what can I share with everyone that they may not know right now? Here's something that I think a lot about, which is a very, well, it's a relatively simple problem to solve, but it's probably going to give you or the next generation that you leave your Bitcoin to the most bang for buck in that getting your estate plan sorted out and ensuring that you can minimize or mitigate any estate taxes is probably the most effective thing that you can do for generational wealth. And 
I'll just put this into context that across most of Europe, and it's going to get worse, so these taxes are only going to go up, but across Europe, across the UK, across the US and Northern America, you typically have an estate tax, death duties, whatever you want to call it, of 40%. Now, if you're smart, you can seek help in mitigating and avoiding that 40% death duty tax, whatever you want to call it. And it is, it is such a big difference for how much Bitcoin you leave your estate because you're not saving them 40% in taxes. What you're giving them is an extra two thirds, an extra 66% more Bitcoin than you would otherwise leave them. So I look at it that way that you know, the number one bang for buck that anyone who's got death duties in the country that they live in, the number one thing a bit, as a Bitcoiner that they should be taking care of is an estate plan that is going to help you avoid and mitigate any of those death duties. Because if you can do that and you've got a 40% tax rate on, on death, you're going to leave 66% more Bitcoin to your loved ones. That's a big deal. That's a huge deal. Uh, taxes is a topic that I'm right now <laughs> going down the road because uh, till February, I didn't have to pay taxes in terms of my uh, employee paid the taxes. Uh, and when the employee pays them, you don't see him that much and then you don't care that much, uh, which is an amazing concept for the government. But all of a sudden you become, you step from being employed to being self-employed and starting like a self-employed company, you have to pay every taxes yourself. And you're like, oh, I don't know. I don't want to pay the, my government this much. Uh, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, okay, this I can do, this I can do, this I can do. So I, I, I right now go to, down the rabbit hole of what I can do. And it's amazing for me what, what, what the possibilities are, even in, in Austria, what you, you can do legally in Austria. But yeah, it's, uh, I will maybe... Uh, in half a year or one year, if I'm more educated on that, make a, a long video on that, what my uh, experiences with that was, because I think a lot of um, <laughs> the, I, I saw yesterday a video somewhere and he's like, like the, the, the best saving you can do is on taxes, everything else, spend it and enjoy your life. But on, on taxes, that's the, the biggest saving you can do for yourself. And otherwise, the, other than that, focus on getting your income up. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, it's a really good. It's funny, I've spent the last couple of weeks in America and I went to the Nashville con conference, thought it was great, but um, while I was in America, I got to spend time with some of America's best asset protection and tax lawyers in the country. And what I learned was so incredibly mind-blowing, I can't tell you. I'm just looking at this thinking that the ability to um, reduce your taxable income, um, create favourable tax outcomes and help um, avoid some of those estate taxes was just mind blowing to me. And this is where for me, I look at this and think, um, this is where a lot of the opportunity comes for the Bitcoiners that they don't really comprehend or understand what this tax system is going to do to them and the provisions and protections that are afforded to them if they want to play inside the system. And this is where I spend a lot of my time. I'm I, I play inside the system because I'm licensed by it and the rest of it and can show you a whole host of benefits to doing that. But at the same time, I respect everyone's uh, ability to do non-KYC, non-AML, remain completely anon and 100% privacy focused. So um, if you want to play in the KYC space and you know take advantage of those sorts of things, then uh, I'm your man. But um, I respect everyone's right to do whatever they want to. And uh, one of my personal adages is you do you. So, um, but take care of your Bitcoin. It's going to go up a lot. And if there's any help that we can give in doing that, Please, please reach out. Absolutely, and uh, I, will, I will. Oh, let, let's do it just now. Like I usually ask in the end of the podcast, where people can reach you. But I think it's suiting now really good, as you mentioned it. Where can people reach out to you? Where can people contact uh, you and the Bitcoin Advisory? Uh, thank you, uh, Robin. The best place to do that is thebitcoinadvisor.com, and that is advisor with an er. Uh, there's a website. There's an about us page. Contact details. Pop the details in there, or book a meeting with me. Um, or any of the team, we've got one of the best Bitcoin teams in the world. I'm so privileged and humbled that um, we've got some of the world's best Bitcoiners there. So book a meeting with any of us. We'd love to help and talk Bitcoin. Um, or if you're on Twitter or X, uh, reach out to Peter BTC Advisor with an ER and uh, DMs are open. 
just shoot me an email. Or DM. Absolutely. Uh, I think we I had like three or four already from the team on, uh, probably maybe even more <laughs> because there's so yeah. many great Bitcoiners uh, already on. I have to check. Uh, maybe maybe let's do like a whole rundown so I have every advisor <laughs> on the podcast. <laughs> um, but we still have also the, the end routine from the, uh, uh, that I do since the first podcast where the previous nice. guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest is. It's also an interesting one, uh, not as tricky as <laughs> the last one, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had a supernatural experience? Maybe Trump? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. You know what? The closest, there are sort of two near-death experiences that I've had in life. Um, one was being less than a metre or two from a 14, 13 to 14 foot great white shark. And I was maybe a kilometre or two off the coast. And I, I may have done a deal with God that, I'll be a better person if you let me off the hook here. I thought I was going to die. Uh, and then there was another experience that I had in Whistler, British Columbia, on a ski resort. I basically went into an area that was roped off and got caught in an avalanche. And I thought I was dead. So as a kid, I literally thought I was dead and uh, pinched myself, realised that I wasn't, dug myself out of a, basically a, having been covered up to my face and uh, basically went in for the day. It was the first run and it was the last run of the day. So I basically went in and feeling like I'd cheated death. So there are two moments in my life where I feel like I've cheated death and maybe had an out-of-body out of body experience. So that'd be the closest to it. Thank you so much, Peter, for, for sharing this with us. Also, thank you so much for uh, being on the podcast today, taking the time uh, to be on my podcast today again. Um, also, thank you for everyone watching and listening. As always, uh, I'll be back uh, tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.